Pitch to Pro is the official podcast of USL Arkansas. This will be our platform to tell our story about the club and the special place that we call home, Northwest Arkansas. This is a journey. We want to bring you along for the ride. We'll share what's going on behind the curtain, help educate the community at large about soccer, our league, and give updates on the progress of the club along the way. Together, we'll explore and unpack our journey to professional soccer, the magic that is NWA, our community, and talk all things soccer from on the pitch to behind the scenes, telling the story of our club. Pitch to Pro Podcast is proudly sponsored by PodcastVideos.com. PodcastVideos.com is Northwest Arkansas's premier podcast recording studio. Equipped with industry-leading equipment, the recording studio and services save you time, money, and hassle. They are dedicated to helping you create, record, and publish high-quality podcasts for your audience. Be sure to check them out today at podcastvideos.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Pitch to Pro podcast. I'm your host, Wes Harris, Managing Director for USL Arkansas. We are Northwest Arkansas's professional soccer club playing in the United Soccer League. Today, I have a really special guest here to talk with us uh, who has a ton of just great experience in and around soccer, the game, as well as our league. Uh, Mr. Ben Frickley, thank you so much, sir, for for jumping on here with us. Uh, ben was just a little, I'll let him introduce himself, but just as a bit, bit of a background here, Ben was a player. He's played the game. He's helped the club get up and running from the ground up in USL. He was a coach, and correct me if I'm wrong, but also a sporting director at, at a little bit, jumped in that space as well. General manager. General manager, so even bigger. <laughs> I stand corrected. Thank you, sir. And now does some incredible work in the sports psychology space, uh, working with some various clubs uh, across different leagues. So, Ben, I kind of teed you up there, but I want what I want you to do is just introduce yourself just a little bit, your background, uh, before we kind of jump into some of your incredible stories that uh, I would love to get into today with the audience. You got it, Wes. First off, thanks for having me today. This is... Uh, what you guys are doing, incredible to be watching and uh, Thank in in a town that I already love living in. This is just an incredible bonus to be adding this level of the game here. So my family and I are so excited. Uh, my background, I, as you said, I've been in sport and mostly soccer my whole life. I was a college soccer player at Georgia Southern University. And I know there are a couple of fellow Eagles that live here in Bentonville, Arkansas as well. So shout out to all my fellow Eagles, uh, when go. it went right into college soccer coaching right away. And along the way, probably 10 years in, felt that the psychological part of the game was was a big gap mm -hmm. in, in my coaching toolkit. Mm -hmm. So around 2010 is when I went back to school, continued to coach, also added a master's and ultimately a doctor, doctoral degree in sport and performance psychology. And for the last almost 10 years now, my full-time job has been in sport and performance psychology. I worked a couple years with special operations forces, specifically with the Army Rangers, mm -hmm. doing performance psychology with them. I spent five years with the Toronto Blue Jays, working in the minor and major league baseball. And then more recently, uh, I work for myself now and consult with uh, one of your future opponents, the Tampa <laughs> Bay Rowdies. Great, great organization, incredible people, incredible players there. And and also with Atlanta United, that's that's those are two of my uh, big clients that I have the opportunity to to work with. So, um, and, and as you mentioned as well, along the way had a extremely memorable stop with <laughs> Tormenta. Yeah, and uh, literally watched a, a pile of dirt yep. turn into some training fields, eventually a stadium, and watched a whole community rally around the game. Yeah, and uh, had an opportunity to be wear a couple hats there as as the general manager and first ever head coach of Tormenta, and they've gone on to do some incredible things, winning a, winning a championship last year, mm -hmm. and also have some amazing people that are working there. And it's neat; a lot of the people that I coached are now working at some level yeah. uh, at the club there as well. That's so super cool. There's a little too. bit about me. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Thank you, and. You know, you kind of teed me up there really nicely to kind of dovetail into kind of what I wanted to to just jump in and talk with you a little bit uh, about next, which is, you know, we're doing something that not many people get to do, which is 
start a professional sports franchise uh, from scratch, uh, from nothing, and build it from the ground up with a community. Um, and there are very few people that are you know able to say that they have done that or been around to do that or see that in some way. Uh, and you're definitely one of those. Uh, and in this league with a, a, a special community like the South Georgia Tormenta community and, and that club and that team, can you talk a little bit about your experience there and that story of of kind of how you helped that club kind of get up and running? Well, I was really, like you, Wes, I, you know, it, it takes a team. Yeah. It really takes a team. There, there are no small parts in something like this. There may be certain roles that are more community facing and some may be more behind the scenes. Sure. But it it absolutely takes a team. I was extremely lucky with Tormenta that I I had people like Darren Van Tassel who just rolled up his sleeves from the beginning and was all in on wanting to do this. Yeah. And um you also had uh people like we had a woman uh, Heidi Jeffers who who was a, a local uh I, I think icon for me in the community and just knew how to uh, market and get the community involved. She didn't need, she didn't know anything about soccer sure. and she didn't need to. You don't need she, to. Yeah. She just, she just, she was an expert in how to get people to care about local projects. And that's what I see you guys doing yeah. as well. The first time I met with you and even the location of where you choose to chose to have that first meeting together and near where the stadium was going to be, mm-hmm. I just left there thinking, "Oh, these guys are thinking about this from every level." And, and back then, we were we were thinking about how to involve the university. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had Georgia Southern University right there, and we needed to be a great partner with them. And then you need to be, th- and then you needed to be thinking about uh, local youth clubs. Uh, I mean. Yep. What an opportunity for kids in smaller areas, smaller soccer markets uh, to watch high level soccer and maybe be sitting in the stands and thinking to themselves, I might be able to do that as well. That's and it, you've man. got some vicarious experience taking place. I mean, I, I remember being at a Rowdy's game a couple years ago. And my son wasn't even 10 at the time yeah. saying, Dad, I want to play soccer next year. And that's that's those those things are going to happen here yeah. in Bentonville, yeah, and and in the Northwest Arkansas area because of what you guys are doing. Yeah, we were trying to think about those same things. How is our project going to inspire the youth market? How's mm-hmm. it going to be a? How can we be a great partner to the university? How can local businesses want to want to tie in to what we're doing? We wanted to be a model of of excellence. Yeah. You know, we wanted to put a product out on the field that really inspired people and and played a good brand of soccer as well. So I'm not telling you anything you don't know. There are a lot of layers that that we were thinking about yeah. right then. There's back a then. ton. There's a ton. No, that's great. And you actually said something that um is kind of interesting and I want to come back to a lot of people and it, 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 it maybe not, but it's just in conversations that I've had with folks is a lot of people think that a lot of these owners or investors, you know, they they know a ton about running a soccer team. And the reality is, you know, they and and I'm not I, I don't want this to be misconstrued in any way. A lot of how people come into owning or running or being a part of the project in a meaningful way, whatever that looks like. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have this grand experience of building and running a soccer club. Not everybody has a Warren Smith experience mm-hmm. or a Ben Frankley experience. They just care about the community and they are just active members and know how to rally people around a cause or an initiative and get people about an exciting project and, and get people excited about it. And so I think it's passion for a community and a place um, and an understanding of, of the power of sport um, and having everybody has, a, has a, a story about the power of sport, whatever that might be in, in whatever you know, capacity. Everybody can appreciate that. Um, and I think that's kind of an interesting thing when you kind of step back and think about 
it, not everybody's a soccer expert that has gone on and 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 fun, founded or funded or whatever uh, on a professional soccer level. They just care about their communities and they want to build something special with them, especially in the USL where it's not it, it's it's kind of a different model than than MLS or NBA or mm -hmm. NFL. Uh, it's a different model. It's so much you know more community based and, and ingrained in that and very grassroots. And so I thought that that was really interesting that you brought that up and talked about that. And your success with the Tormenta was kind of foundational in that aspect. Um, and well, so I think from my experience, Darren, owner, still owner, yeah, and his wife Nitra, they they did all those things that you just said. Mm -hmm. They were phenomenal around bridge building relationships, making making a case for why it made sense. One of the things they were also and were elite with dur during my time there um, is they also knew when to get out of the way. Yeah. And so when they when when an organization brings in somebody like yourself or eventually brings in a sporting director, a general manager, a head coach, mm -hmm. you know, the, these leaders and owners, they lean into their strengths. They may be excellent at finance. They may be yeah. excellent at strategy. But they're also really good at knowing how to empower people and let others lean into their strikes. And that was certainly my experience at Tormenta. Darren and I knew the things that we needed to do together. And we also needed we also knew areas where mm -hmm. I would flex in to to my experiences and strengths, and he would flex in to his. But we also just you can't do this without an elite level of collaboration. Yeah. And I think um, you bring up an, a fantastic point. And as you know, I think Chris and I, our, our co-founder, have has have spent uh, a long time in, in the corporate world and in uh, corporate America. And I think that that's very true of any good leader um, or good teammate, sure, even um, where you have to recognize when you are not the subject matter expert and what is your role then become? You become. I'm a follower and support system now. How can I best support you and let you run and do the things that you are great at? And this is why you're here mm -hmm. is to do those things and be the expert in that area. And this is why you hire a general manager. And this is why you hire a head coach. And this is why you hire an operations person and all those different things. Um, and so I think you bring up an excellent, excellent point. And then it's also, and this is something we'll get into a little bit later, is also... That's very, you can transfer that right onto the field and you have a team that understands each other's weaknesses, where you may need to cover for this player and where you need to just get out of the way and let them take that person on one V one, because mm -hmm. that's what they're great at. And you just need to give them space. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that you, you, I love that comment and it has so many different, uh, applications into Yes, what we're doing on and off the pitch, but also just for people in general as they kind of look to build their careers and That's continue right. to go. Recognize when it's time to to lead if you're in that type of a role and then recognize when you're as that leader, it is your role to kind of take a step back and support and let the you, let your people run. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a ton of examples where we can get into that, but that's such a great point. I love that. So thank you. Um, Talk a little bit about, you know, the, the, the Tormenta is a great example. Um, you're, you're there in South Georgia and you have a professional soccer team in USL. We're here in Northwest Arkansas, another Southern market. You've got Louisville, one of the top markets in the USL, uh, in, in the South. I think this is, it, it's, it's interesting and, and kind of a, a, a paradox of a story in a way, but a lot of successful professional soccer markets, especially in our league, you've got Atlanta United, one of the biggest fan bases mm. in all of Major League Soccer and, and, and North America soccer. And you can talk about that. You've got Tampa Bay Rowdies. Um, the South, I think, gets this stigma or this, this um, reputation as being football country and American football country or basketball. You've got some great basketball programs. Um, and, and soccer just isn't, you know, it's, it's, it's not quite there. This is baseball country, basketball and, and, and football, but you've got this incredible list and number FC Dallas, all these, you know, pro clubs and programs 
that are doing so so well. Houston just made a big run in mm-hmm. in in the MLS Cup. Mm-hmm. Um, talk a little bit about that from from kind of your perspective, and and I, it's a, it's a really interesting story to me, um, and I love to see it just as a soccer fan and freak. But um, has you know how USL has kind of been able to jump into these pockets and these markets that are outside of the top 25, 30 DMAs that your mate MLS or NBAs that they stick to. And it's true in other parts of the country too, but I feel like they've also been really able to kind of take advantage of what this kind of sleeper uh, soccer market in the South. Back in 2016, when we had our first home game at Tormenta, I mean, and, and it was PDL yeah. back then. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's USL. But back then they they called it PDL and I think we had thirty five hundred wow people yeah and I just remember walking out and saying the same thing yeah. that night I mean I I said wow and I had to remind myself you're here to coach the team but this is <laughs> yeah. this is really cool yeah and I was just so, I was so excited for for all of us we had a saying it at. at Tormento, which is pros start here because it, it, it was the PDL and, mm-hmm. and it was the first pathway into pro. And before even fans came through the gate, you know, we, we were just thinking about how to take care of the players. You know, we felt if, if you really looked after them and, and took care of them and, and mm-hmm. took as much off their plate as you could, then they could really focus on putting a great product out on the field. West that night, thirty five hundred people came out to that game. Yeah, and we lost that night, mm-hmm. but we won in terms of yeah. of the experience. And we did things that that I thought were essential. For example, placing portable stands right behind the goal during mm-hmm. a college soccer season. For whatever reason, Georgia Southern wasn't doing that, which I thought was even hurting the right. experience for the university players. But we were able to make that happen for for the pro team, and and you would have players that would score a goal and run right behind the goal yeah. and be able to celebrate with the fans, and that made them feel so cool, like they were a part of the experience. Yeah, and it it just the way that that Tormenta was able to transform a college soccer track and soccer complex to make it feel like a soccer specific environment again mm-hmm. there's no small parts no and we would have our players on game day moving those bleachers yeah. out behind this the stuff you don't see yeah about kind of like you said right. different markets that's definitely not happening at atlanta united on no, game no, day no. you aren't having players move that around so it, it was it was just so much work that went in but what I saw, the players were absolutely invested. And because we took such great care of them, when we asked them to help move bleachers and things like that, they didn't say a word about it. Mm-mm. They really felt like it was it was really unique what they were getting to do. And we were all reminded each other, we were the first ones that ever got to do something like this. And, and you're getting to experience that as well as you know. Yeah, yeah. And it's great. I mean... You know, you talk about, I mean, even talk about like Atlanta and the 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 fandom that you experience there when you're there, man. I mean, that's just got to be wild. They they pack that place. And for those that don't know, they play in the same stadium that the Falcons do, Mercedes-Benz. <laughs> no, the Falcons play in the same stadium that Atlanta United does. <laughs> there, there you go. There you go. And that's, uh, I'm sure, what Atlanta United fans would say. Um, but I mean, that's the ownership that they have there, yeah. right? Uh, in terms of the emotional ownership over that that town and that club. I mean, you get to experience it firsthand, man. Talk about it. I don't even... I can't really put that into words. I remember my first time uh, walking across the bends for the first ever game that I, that I got to attend, and the person kind of escorted me across was kind of walking me, and I said, "Do you mind if we just stop for a minute? Yeah, Cause yeah. take it all to in. be able to out on the field and and to look up." And I've been to many games there now, and every single time, electricity is coursing through your veins when you walk through there. I've been there when there's been 40,000. I've been there when there's 70,000. Yeah. 
and every time you can feel an entire city behind their team. Yeah. And what they do in the supporters section, I know you recently had on uh, a local supporters group. Yeah. And what that brings, that that aspect, the social element mm -hmm. that a group like that brings to the team. Wes, I, I was at one of our playoff games against against Columbus when when uh, Shande, one of our players, he kind of missed a sitter and it was a tough moment for him. And and then for the next almost three minutes, the entire stadium was chanting that guy's name. I mean, you talk about home field advantage. Yeah, yeah. And this is a message for anybody that listens to this. You you think, oh, well, going or not going to the game doesn't make that much. It makes a difference. Absolutely. The players on the field can absolutely feel when they have a whole community behind them. Yeah. And if there's ever that kind of 12th man advantage, that's what that home field element brings to it. Going to a game at the Benz is a, for, for any soccer fan, it's a must. And I've, I've, I've talked to many players on the Atlanta United team that have played in Champions League games, yeah. that have played in stadiums all over the world, and the Mercedes-Benz Stadium is at the top of their list of best places to play. That's awesome. That's awesome. I mean, you know, uh, unfortunately, we won't be building a 60 or 70,000 seat stadium, maybe one day, guys, but not, not in the foreseeable near future. But uh, I can promise you that the atmosphere that we want to bring and aspire to bring, and so too does our supporters group, if you hear them talk, is going to build that and create that in our own way uh, and make our house just an absolute fortress. Um, and so I loved what Carlos said, uh, no matter what happens on the field, you have to win in the stands. I love that. And you have to be able to look back and say that you did everything you could as a fan and, and we brought the atmosphere. And if it was an unfortunate result, we'll, we'll live to fight another day. But our guys, uh, and, and ladies knew that, that we were there to support them with everything that we had. So, um, can't ask for more than that. Yeah, you know, no, no, you can't, you know, and, and, and that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. So, um, you talked a little bit about it. Um, Northwest Arkansas, now kind of moving into our project and you're so excited about it. And, and, you know, we've talked with you a couple of times and just appreciate your insight so much. You, as, as someone that's been around the sport, been around pro sports, been around soccer, been around USL, been around MLS, MLB. Now you've, you've been a resident of NWA for a few years. What about this market have you seen? Like we, we all know that this is going to work internally, uh, but, and I think a lot of people can, can feel that it is and it's exciting, but from your perspective, why do you think this is going to work? And, and, and in this market specifically, this sport, Talk a little bit about what makes you excited about a USL clone coming to to Northwest Arkansas. So, first, traveling some with the Rowdies mm -hmm. to bigger or smaller markets, mm -hmm. I've I've seen a following no matter no matter where we've gone. Yeah, Pe people have have support e even in Atlanta United where they have the twos that used to be in yeah. the MLS uh, in the USL. You would still get supporters go out to that. Uh, I've been to games at Tulsa mm -hmm. where they play, unfortunately, in inside of a baseball stadium. Mm -hmm. But that does not stop the people mm -mm. from coming out and supporting their team. Yep. And Wes, I, I think that uh, people here can be very uh, selective and where they want to spend their time and where they spend their money. Yep. Northwest Arkansas has a lot of options for hobbies, recreation, and mm -hmm. and leisure. Yeah. And I know that you and your team have have thought about that. Yep. And so, you know, this what this makes me think about. I lived in Savannah, Georgia, when the bananas came to town. Uh, yeah. I I lived yeah. I lived to, and I and I know we're not a uh, a gimmicky experience. Sure. But but what I do appreciate about what you all are doing is the idea that uh there's gonna be kind of a party taking place yeah. in in the stands. There's some incredible vibes going on there. And oh by the way, there's an incredible product out on the field as well. So I think this is gonna work because you've got a lot of soccer people that mm -hmm. that are in this area. Yep. I think this is going to work because 
There's not uh, U of A, for example, doesn't have uh, a men's product. They've got an incredible, incredible women's, women's game team. there, but they don't have right now um, uh, something for, for males. You guys are going to be able to pro really provide that in the region. Mm -hmm. um, and also just, again, going back to to the couple times that I've met with you all, what you and Chris and Warren are thinking about right now, the collective experience and the passion that you have and the grassroots element. I mean, you guys are everywhere. You're yeah. everywhere. I was over at the Jones Center meeting with them a couple of weeks ago and, you know, y your name and, and USL Arkansas came up and someone's like, oh yeah, I see those guys everywhere. And, and so I think the- That's great to hear. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, the grassroots, the, the really trying to building this and the, really the compression effort. I know you're working at the top, you know, to get partnerships, sponsors, financial backing, but you're also working at the bottom as well, just around people mm -hmm. that love the game. And you're, you're, com you're compressing those two together until you're ready to bring the product out there. Right. So, I mean, for me, the region that we live in, when, when I heard that you guys were doing this, I was like, yeah, that, that just makes total sense. And I think you have people here that even though they can be selective on where they, they spend their time and money, they don't need to love soccer no. to come and experience. And it's only going to take one or two games when it's done right. Yep. When it's done right. And, um, and, and where, for people just to have a great time, whether they're sitting in the supporter section or different pricing packages of seats, uh, that experience they get is, is it's all it's going to take to hook them. It's a different experience. It is. It just is. Um, and it's so unique and special. Uh, and man, I just, I can't wait. Every time I get, I, I get goosebumps. I literally have goosebumps right now. Um, and just thinking about it and talking about it with you in the atmosphere that we're going to create and the, the special, you know, thing that we're trying to, trying to build here with the community. Um, so last and, and for me, uh, one of the really cool things about you and your experience and, uh, is kind of your next evolution of your career and where you've been working on for, for the last decade or so is, is that, and maybe longer that sports psychology space. Um, talk a little bit more about the work that you do and kind of the evolution of that space as it relates to pro sports and how it could even translate into, cause one of the things that I'm also really passionate about is youth sports, youth mm -hmm. soccer. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit more about what you do there and, and how you engage with clubs and players and staff and um, yeah. Sure. So most of my work that I do now uh, is is a lot of individual one-on-one -on -one work with with players and coaches. Okay. Um, our, when I was with the Blue Jays, we came up with our but what's our departmental, what's our mental performance department's philosophy? And, and it's this, and I still believe in it to this day, it's elite performers can self-regulate their attention and their emotion under pressure in any circumstance. So, you know, you're, you're a goalkeeper about to face a PK or somebody about to take a penalty kick, mm -hmm. or you're up one zero with five minutes to go. That and, PK thing, just real quick, one of the most mentally- Right strenuous things right. that you can go through as an athlete. By right. The way. Or imagine being or a, a baseball yeah. player with, uh, you know, bases loaded and being exactly. the pitcher or the hitter in that moment. And focusing on the right things can go very well and the wrong things can, mm -hmm. you know, end up having you wishing you had that moment back many times over. So, um, yeah, I, I, my help, my work that I do right now is, predominantly one-on-one -on -one, and it's so individualistic Wes. you know sports psych is not a canned approach um you know i had two sessions with with pro soccer players yesterday one specifically wanted to talk about goals for 2024 and mm -hmm. that just to me is a testament of how elite these guys are i mean the season just ended just ended <laughs> and it's no west for the weary it's been i want to get on a call i want to talk about my goals for preseason, my goals during the season. Yeah. And it's just so fun to to be in those conversations. Uh, and then another player, it was, uh, he is toward the end of the year, uh, made his way back from an injury. Mm -hmm. 
and and it's still not feeling great. Yeah. And so the thoughts and feelings that that come along with that and and you know basically Wes, that's anxiety that's a lot of a lot of uh, a player's mind in the future. And so again the self-regulation of attention would be well how do you bring your attention back onto what you are doing right now? Mm-hmm. And so it, it's just so unique the the work that I'm doing now from a team perspective. Uh, I'm when I work with the entire team, it would be around team dynamics. It would be around uh, earlier what you mentioned about role strengths on the field. Mm-hmm. A lot of that task cohesion on the field. I know what Wes is going to do. Wes knows what Ben is going to do. And in my team sessions, it's trying to help really, really pull that out. But most of it is. It's one on one working with with players and coaches about um, maybe performance gaps, but also strengths as well. I think sports psych, you know, gets uh, a little bit of a stereotype that that uh, people in my field are there to play deficit detective and look for what's wrong with a player from a mental skills perspective or what's wrong with the team. But but I'm equally equally and and a lot of times starting with looking for what's right and trying to pull. And, and making sure players and teams are leaning into their strengths as well. No, that's so cool. Um, and I love, I love your point about you know the individual one on one. It's really not a canned approach. I don't think it can be, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. everybody's different. Every situation is different. You have to be able to adapt right. um, and be able to you know assess and diagnose and whatever. Here's the game plan, and it's going to be so different for each player or coach or situation or team. Um, how has that kind of evolved? I think even in fairly recent sure timelines, um, because and I you know whether it's a broader conversation, um, you know as just society and and mental health and well being uh, has come a lot more to the forefront and become you know less taboo and and more part of our everyday conversation. Um, and then making its way into sports and, and, you know, either fortunately or unfortunately, uh, you know, their, their lives are a lot of the time in the spotlight. And so whether they like it or not, they kind of get thrust up there on this platform and, you know, they're kind of guinea pigs in a way in terms of kind of what does it mean to talk about these things in the open forum and, and trying to make it normal and normalizing it. Um, you know, I don't want to steal your thunder, but like uh, all of these things kind of really interest me and intrigue me and, mm-hmm. and kind of you watch the evolution of that space over the last few years. Um, and you have, you know, I think of athletes like Naomi Osaka, uh, who took some time mm-hmm. and just literally time mm-hmm. off. Like I need to go work on, on, on me, mm. uh, and just take a break just for my own health. Um, and mental health is health, all those things. Yeah. Well, love well it's, not, it's not my thunder. It's our responsibility. Yeah. You nailed it. This has been more normalized and we still have a long, long we, way to go. Yes, we do. Uh, <clears throat> we're lucky that uh, more and more athletes that are in the spotlight are stepping forward mm-hmm. and normalizing with a lot of courage and vulnerability. This is what's going on in my life. Yeah. Uh, it was some pretty real experiences that I had working with the Blue Jays that motivated me to add uh, clinical mental health counseling to my uh, uh, education. So Mm -hmm. when I was going through to uh, get my doctoral work, it's a blended program. So it's a doctoral degree in sport and performance psychology with an emphasis in clinical mental health counseling. And along the way, one of my mentors, uh, who's a real legend in the field of psychology, Dr. Stephen Hayes, he he, he he reminded me mental health is not a one in five thing. Mental health is a five out of five thing or five out of five people. And it just varies in degree, intensity, and and, and frequency. Exactly. So some, some people um, have diagnosed clinical mental health issues, mm-hmm. disorders, and other people can experience some uh, mental health challenges that may not need a diagnosis or long-term treatment, but we all struggle. And and my goal, and this is I learned this from my mentor, Dr. Hayes, is that we don't suffer in silence. 
Yeah. And so I think it's our responsibility to to normalize this and and give players a platform uh, mm -hmm. in in team environments. That that is part of why I get employed by those teams that I mentioned earlier is to make sure that well being is a critical component. And 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 if you're only a win at all cost team, if the only conversations are about winning and performance, yeah. then the environment becomes very transactional mm -hmm. and it can make it really tough for a player to be vocal about any challenges they may be experiencing. But if you're in an environment where you're ready to offer, yes, we want to win, we're never going to take that off the table. When this right. team gets stood up, you guys want to go undefeated. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. But we also want to operationalize success in looking at what type of resources mm -hmm. do we provide for our players as well. And I think that's that's why I'm so grateful. The organizations that I've had a chance to be a part of, roles like mine are not just box checking. They they give people like me a real opportunity to get in and to do work and to help players when when they need help. And I think the more proactive we can be with this, the more we normalize it, the more players are going to feel like they're in an environment where they can be set up to bring their best out when it's time to perform because they know they have people that are there to support them as well. Yeah, no, and I love this episode. I love this topic. Uh, I love, you know, I could talk to you all day, man. How does this, I think it's also important to talk about how this translates into the youth game. Mm. Uh, and I think work that still needs to be done because I think now we're starting to normalize it and talk about it in the professional space. Um, but also there's a lot to be said about everything and, and, and the, the strains on, uh, a growing youth and maturing youth, a teenager, all the things of life now, especially in this day and age with all the technology, social media pressures and everything else about just being a teenager. Oh, by the way, you're now a, a you know, potentially a high level athlete trying to make it to the next level and the pressures that come with that. Um, you know, and, and you know, I, I think that there's a lot more room, uh, not just at the professional level, but especially even into the youth space, uh, within sports. Yep. Yeah. We need to be supporting coaches. Co co I, it's been my experience that most of the coaches that I come across are as enthusiastic as, as you and I are. Yeah about how to <clears throat> understand the psychological, social, emotional needs of athletes. There is <clears throat> a great model out there, comes out of Canada in terms of long-term athlete development, mm -hmm. which is pretty prescriptive of what different ages and stages need in the athlete's journey. Yeah. By the time, by the time athletes are, are putting on that USL jersey, Winning is absolutely a priority. At nine years old, it's not. Right. And the challenge that we have, especially in our country, is, you know, we we overemphasize the result and we underemphasize developmental opportunities, technical yep. developmental opportunities, psychological mm -hmm. development opportunities, emotional development opportunities. But I but I think for the most part, a lot of the coaches that I've come across are eager to learn this. Yeah. And I think that there are are little things that that we can do as coaches to bake sports psychology concepts into the environment. For example, getting our players to reflect more. Yep. I, I think, you know, if I if I had only one opportunity to to get in front of a group of coaches, I would want to encourage them to hold back more on the prescriptive, directive, instructive telling all the time yeah. and maybe lean more into curiosity with players mm -hmm. and and be more of a guide for players to empower them and 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 ask them questions like Wes when you were getting all the ball there you know you you played back to the goalkeeper but what were your other options oh coach I could have I could have dribbled inside okay you could have dribbled inside then what would have happened yeah and then players are really feeling a real sense of self and and self-expression and there's just some so much great 
research out there on the self-determination theory mm -hmm. and some environmental factors like autonomy and competence and yep. sense of belonging that can prime motivation. And just with a few tweaks to the environment, those can be the differences between players choosing to stay in the sport and continue to develop versus, uh, you know, I didn't really feel like I belonged. Ah, I felt like my my yeah. coach just yelled at me on the time and didn't really praise me that much. Right. Peace out. I'm going to go try another sport or exactly. quit altogether. Or quit altogether. Yeah. yeah. Which is just the worst scenario. Yeah. As, you're right. Yeah. As a coach, my I do coach youth and, and my number one goal, I have two goals. One, did they, three goals. One, did they have fun? Two, did they learn something? And three, I, I don't even, I, I would love it if they got better, but as long as they're learning, that should come. What age? They're they're seven. Yeah, I tell I tell I tell moms and dads all the time. They're seven. I tell moms and dads all the time. If your if your player is seven, eight, or nine, and at the end of the season they want to play again the that's next exactly season, you've my, done your that, job. That's my number three. That that's the metric. That's, that's success. It. They want to play again. Did they sign up again for the next year or the next season? Then great. They're as as back. they get older, we we can add on. Exactly. We can we can assess different things, but at seven, oh, if they yep. want to play that where they're eight. You were an amazing coach. <laughs> well, that's awesome, man. And and gosh, we could make 10 podcast episodes together. Uh, but for now, I'll say thank you uh, one more time for coming out. And just a reminder to everybody to just go online, appreciate your support. Go online, find us at pitchtopro.com, uslarkansas.com, uh, at pitch to pro and at USL Arkansas. Engage with us, talk to us. We want to hear from you. And can't wait to continue building this with you guys. Until next time, thanks for joining us on Pitch to Pro. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Wes.